section twenty of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli the history of writing masters there is a very apt letter from james i to prince henry when very young on the neatness and fairness of his handwriting the royal father suspecting that the prince's tutor mr afterwards sir adam newton had helped out the young prince in the composition and that in this specimen of calligraphy he had relied also on the pains of mr peter bales the great writing-master for touching up his letters his majesty shows a laudable anxiety that the prince should be impressed with the higher importance of the one over the other james shall himself speak i confess i long to receive a letter from you that may be wholly yours as well matter as form as well formed by your mind as drawn by your fingers for ye may remember that in my book to you i warn you to beware with of that kind of wit that may fly out at the end of your fingers not that i commend not a fair handwriting said hoc facito illud non omitito and the others multo magis precipium prince henry indeed wrote with that elegance which he borrowed from his own mind and in an age when such minute elegance was not universal among the crowned heads of europe henry the fourth on receiving a letter from prince henry immediately opened it a custom not usual with him and comparing the writing with the signature to decide whether it were of one hand sir george carey observing the french king's hesitation called mr douglas to testify to the fact on which henry the great admiring an art in which he had little skill and looking on the neat elegance of the writing before him politely observed i see that in writing fair as in other things the elder must yield to the younger had this anecdote of neat writing reached the professors of calligraphy who in this country have put forth such painful panegyrics on the art these royal names had unquestionably blazoned their pages not indeed that these penmen require any fresh inflation for never has there been a race of professors in any art who have exceeded in solemnity and pretensions the practitioners in this simple and mechanical craft i must leave to more ingenious investigators of human nature to reveal the occult cause which has operated such powerful delusions on these viva la plume men who have been generally observed to possess least intellectual ability in proportion to the excellence they have obtained in their own art i suspect this maniacal vanity is peculiar to the writing-masters of england and i can only attribute the immense importance which they have conceived of their art to the perfection to which they have carried the art of shorthand writing an art which was always better understood and more skilfully practised in england than in any other country it will surprise some when they learn that the artists in verse and colours poets and painters have not raised loftier pretensions to the admiration of mankind writing masters or calligraphers have had their engraved effigies with a fame in flourishes a pen in one hand and a trumpet in the other and fine verses inscribed in their very lives written they have compared the nimbly turning of their silver quill to the beautiful in art and the sublime in invention nor is this wonderful since they discovered the art of writing like the invention of language in a divine original and from the tablets of stone which the deity himself delivered they trace their german broad text or their fine running hand one for the bold striking of those words viva la plume was so sensible of the reputation that this last piece of command of hand would give the book which he thus adorned and which his biographer acknowledges was the product of about a minute but then how many years of flourishing had that single minute cost him that he claims the glory of an artist observing 
we seldom find the man of business with the artist joined another was flattered that his writing could impart immortality to the most wretched compositions and any lines prove pleasing when you write sometimes the calligrapher is a sort of hero to you you rare commander of the quill whose wit and worth deep learning and high skill speak you the honour of great tower hill the last line became traditionally adopted by those who were so lucky as to live in the neighbourhood of this parnassus but the reader must form some notion of that charm of calligraphy which has so bewitched its professors when soft bold and free your manuscripts still please how justly bold in snell's improving hand the pen at once joins freedom with command with softness strong with ornaments not vain loose with proportion and with neatness plain not swelled not full complete in every part and artful most when not affecting art and these describe those pencilled knots and flourishes the angels the men the birds and the beasts which as one of them observed he could command even by the gentle motion of his hand all the speciosa marasula of calligraphy thy tender strokes inimitably fine crown with perfection every flowing line and to each grand performance add a grace as curling hair adorns a beauteous face in every page new fancies give delight and sporting round the margin charm the sight one massey a writing-master published in seventeen sixty three the origin and progress of letters the great singularity of this volume is a new species of biography never attempted before in english this consists of the lives of english penmen otherwise writing-masters if some have foolishly enough imagined that the sedentary lives of authors are void of interest from deficient incident and interesting catastrophe what must they think of the barren labours of those who in the degree they become eminent to use their own style in the art of dish dash long tail fly the less they become interesting to the public for what can the most skilful writing-master do but wear away his life in leaning over his pupil's copy or sometimes snatch a pen to decorate the margin though he cannot compose the page montaigne has a very original notion on writing-masters he says that some of those calligraphers who had obtained promotion by their excellence in the art afterwards affected to write carelessly lest their promotion should be suspected to have been owing to such an ordinary acquisition massey is an enthusiast fortunately for his subject he considers that there are schools of writing as well as of painting or sculpture and expatiates with the eye of fraternal feeling on a natural genius a tender stroke a grand performance a bold striking freedom and a liveliness in the sprigged letters and pencilled knots and flourishes while this vasari of writing-masters relates the controversies and the libels of many a rival pen-nibber george shelley one of the most celebrated worthies who have made a shining figure in the commonwealth of english calligraphy born i suppose of obscure parents because brought up in christ's hospital yet under the humble blue coat he laid the foundation of his calligraphic excellence and lasting fame for he was elected writing master to the hospital shelley published his natural writing but alas snell another blue coat transcended the other he was a genius who would bear no brother near the throne i have been informed that there were jealous heart-burnings if not bickerings between him and colonel ayres another of our great reformers in the writing commonweal both eminent men yet like our most celebrated poets pope and addison or to carry the comparison still higher like caesar and pompey one could bear no superior and the other no equal indeed the great snell practised a little stratagem against mr shelley for which if writing-masters held courts-martial this hero ought to have appeared before his brothers 
in one of his works he procured a number of friends to write letters in which massey confesses are some satirical strokes upon shelley as if he had arrogated too much to himself in his book of natural writing they find great fault with pencilled knots and sprigged letters shelley who was an advocate for ornaments in fine penmanship which snell utterly rejected had parodied a well-known line of herbert's in favour of his favourite decorations a knot may take him who from letters flies and turn delight into an exercise these reflections created ill blood and even an open difference among several of the superior artists in writing the commanding genius of snell had a more terrific contest when he published his standard rules pretending to have demonstrated them as euclid would this proved a bone of contention and occasioned a terrific quarrel between mr snell and mr clark this quarrel about standard rules ran so high between them that they could scarce forbear scurrilous language therein and a treatment of each other unbecoming gentlemen both sides in this dispute had their abettors and to say which had the most truth and reason non nostrum est tantis componere lites perhaps both parties might be too fond of their own schemes they should have left them to people to choose which they liked best a candid politician is our massey and a philosophical historian too for he winds up the whole story of this civil war by describing its result which happened as all such great controversies have ever closed who nowadays takes those standard rules either one or the other for their guide in writing this is the finest lesson ever offered to the furious heads of parties and to all their men let them meditate on the nothingness of their standard rules by the fate of mr snell it was to be expected when once these writing masters imagined that they were artists that they would be infected with those plague spots of genius envy detraction and all the jalousie du metier and such to this hour we find them an extraordinary scene of this nature has long been exhibited in my neighbourhood where two doughty champions of the quill have been posting up libels in their windows respecting the inventor of a new art of writing the carstarian or the lewisian when the great german philosopher asserted that he had discovered the method of fluxions before sir isaac and when the dispute grew so violent that even the calm newton sent a formal defiance in set terms and got even george the second to try to arbitrate who would rather have undertaken a campaign the method of fluxions was no more cleared up than the present affair between our two heroes of the quill a recent instance of one of these egregious calligraphers may be told of the late tomkins this vainest of writing-masters dreamed through life that penmanship was one of the fine arts and that a writing-master should be seated with his peers in the academy he bequeathed to the british museum his opus magnum a copy of macklin's bible profusely embellished with the most beautiful and varied decorations of his pen and as he conceived that both the workmen and the work would alike be darling objects with posterity he left something immortal with the legacy his fine bust by chantry unaccompanied by which they were not to receive the unparalleled gift when tomkins applied to have his bust our great sculptor abated the usual price and courteously kind to the feelings of the man said that he considered tomkins as an artist it was the proudest day of the life of our writing master but an eminent artist and wit now living once looking on this fine bust of tomkins declared that this man had died for want of a dinner a fate however not so lamentable as it appeared our penman had long felt that he stood degraded in the scale of genius by not being received at the academy at least among the class of engravers the next approach to academic honour he conceived would be that of appearing as a guest at their annual dinner these invitations are as limited as they are select and all the academy persisted in considering tomkins as a writing-master 
many a year passed every intrigue was practised every remonstrance was urged every stratagem of courtesy was tried but never ceasing to deplore the failure of his hopes it preyed on his spirits and the luckless calligrapher went down to his grave without dining at the academy this authentic anecdote has been considered as satire improperly directed by some friend of mr tomkins but the criticism is much too grave the foible of mr tomkins as a writing-master presents a striking illustration of the class of men here delineated i am a mere historian and am only responsible for the veracity of this fact that mr tomkins lived in familiar intercourse with the royal academicians of his day and was a frequent guest at their private tables and moreover was a most worthy man i believe but is it less true that he was ridiculously mortified by being never invited to the academic dinner on account of his calligraphy he had some reason to consider that his art was of the exalted class to which he aspired to raise it when this friend concludes his eulogy of this writing-master thus mr tomkins as an artist stood foremost in his own profession and his name will be handed down to posterity with the heroes and statesmen whose excellences his penmanship has contributed to illustrate and to commemorate i always give the poor and the contra such men about such things have produced public contests combats à l'outrance where much ink was spilled by the knights in a joust of goose-quills these solemn trials have often occurred in the history of writing-masters which is enlivened by public defiances proclamations and judicial trials by umpires the prize was usually a golden pen of some value one as late as in the reign of anne took place between mr german and mr moore german having courteously insisted that mr moore should set the copy he thus said it ingeniously quaint as more and more our understanding clears so more and more our ignorance appears the result of this pen combat was really lamentable they displayed such an equality of excellence that the umpires refused to decide till one of them espied that mr german had omitted the tittle of an i but mr moore was evidently a man of genius not only by his couplet but in his essay on the invention of writing where occurs this noble passage art with me is of no party a noble emulation i would cherish while it proceeded neither from nor to malevolence bales had his johnson norman his mason airs his matlock and his shelley yet art the while was no sufferer the busybody who officiously employs himself in creating misunderstandings between artists may be compared to a turnstile which stands in every man's way yet hinders nobody and he is the slanderer who gives ear to the slander footnote i have not met with moore's book and am obliged to describe this from the biographia britannica End of footnote. among these knights of the plume volante whose chivalric exploits astounded the beholders must be distinguished peter bales in his joust with javid johnson in this tilting match the guerdon of calligraphy was won by the greatest of calligraphers its arms were assumed by the victor a jour a pen or while the golden pen carried away in triumph was painted with a hand over the door of the calligrapher the history of this renowned encounter was only traditionally known till with my own eyes i pondered on this whole trial of skill in the precious manuscript of the champion himself who like caesar not only knew how to win victories but also to record them peter bales was a hero of such transcendent eminence that his name has entered into our history hollinshed chronicles one of his curiosities of microscopic writing at a time when the taste prevailed for admiring writing which no eye could read in the compass of a silver penny this calligrapher put more things than would fill several of these pages he presented queen elizabeth with the manuscript set in a ring of gold covered with a crystal 
he had also contrived a magnifying glass of such power that to her delight and wonder her majesty read the whole volume which she held on her thumb-nail and commended the same to the lords of the council and the ambassadors and frequently as peter often heard did her majesty vouchsafe to wear this calligraphic ring footnote howes in his chronicle under date fifteen seventy six has thus narrated the story a strange piece of work and almost incredible was brought to pass by an englishman from within the city of london and a clerk of the chancery named peter bales who by his industry and practice of his pen contrived and writ within the compass of a penny the lord's prayer the creed the ten commandments a prayer to god a prayer for the queen his posy is named the day of the month the year of our lord and the reign of the queen and at hampton court he presented the same to the queen's majesty End of footnote. some will think i labour on a cobweb modestly exclaimed burials in his narrative and his present historian much fears for himself the reader's gratitude will not be proportioned to my pains in condensing such copious pages into the size of a silver penny but without its worth for a whole year had david johnson affixed a challenge to any one who should take exceptions to this my writing and teaching he was a young friend of bales daring and longing for an encounter yet bales was magnanimously silent till he discovered that he was doing much less in writing and teaching since this public challenge was proclaimed he then set up his counter challenge and in one hour afterwards johnson arrogantly accepted it in a most despiteful and disgraceful manner bales's challenge was delivered in good terms to all englishmen and strangers it was to write for a gold pen of twenty pounds value in all kinds of hands best straightest and fastest and most kind of ways a full a mean a small with line and without line in a slow set hand a mean facile hand and a fast running hand and further to write truest and speediest most secretary and clerk-like from a man's mouth reading or pronouncing either english or latin young johnson had the hardihood now of turning the tables on his great antagonist accusing the veteran bales of arrogance such an absolute challenge says he was never witnessed by man without exception of any in the world and a few days after meeting bales of set purpose to affront and disgrace him what he could showed bales a piece of writing of secretary's hand which he had very much laboured in fine aboard of parchment footnote this was written in the reign of elizabeth holyoke notices virgin parchment made of an abortive skin membrana virgo peachum on drawing calls parchment simply an abortive uttering to the challenger these words mr bales give me one shilling out of your purse and if within six months you better or equal this piece of writing i will give you forty pounds for it this legal deposit of the shilling was made and the challenger or appellant was thereby bound by law to the performance the day before the trial a printed declaration was affixed throughout the city taunting bales's proud poverty and his pecuniary motives as a thing ungentle base and mercenary and not answerable to the dignity of the golden pen johnson declares he would maintain his challenge for a thousand pounds more but for the respondent's inability to perform a thousand groats bales retorts on the libel declares it as a sign of his rival's weakness yet who so bold as blind bayard that hath not a word of latin to cast at a dog or say boo to a goose on michaelmas day fifteen ninety five the trial opened before five judges the appellant and the respondent appeared at the appointed place and an ancient gentleman was entrusted with the golden pen in the first trial for the manner of teaching scholars after johnson had taught his pupil a fortnight he would not bring him forward this was awarded in favour of bales the second for secretary and clerk-like writing dictating to them both in english and in latin bales performed best being first done written straightest without line with true orthography the challenger himself confessing that he wanted the latin tongue and was no clerk 
the third and last trial for fair writing in sundry kinds of hands the challenger prevailed for the beauty and most authentic proportion and for the superior variety of the roman hand in the court hand the respondent exceeded the appellant and likewise in the set text and in bastard secretary was also somewhat perfecter at length bales perhaps perceiving an equilibrium in the judicial decision to overwhelm his antagonist presented what he distinguishes as his masterpiece composed of secretary and roman hand four ways varied and offering the defendant to let pass all his previous advantages if he could better this specimen of calligraphy the challenger was silent at this moment some of the judges perceiving that the decision must go in favour of bales in consideration of the youth of the challenger lest he might be disgraced to the world requested the other judges not to pass judgment in public bales assures us that he in vain remonstrated for by these means the winning of the golden pen might not be so famously spread as otherwise it would have been to bales the prize was awarded but our history has a more interesting close the subtle machiavellism of the first challenger when the great trial had closed and bales carrying off the golden pen exultingly had it painted and set up for his sign the baffled challenger went about reporting that he had won the golden pen but that the defendant had obtained the same by plots and shifts and other base and cunning practices bales vindicated his claim and offered to show the world his masterpiece which had acquired it johnson issued an appeal to all impartial penmen which he spread in great numbers through the city for ten days a libel against the judges and the victorious defendant he declared that there had been a subtle combination with one of the judges concerning the place of trial which he expected to have been before penmen but not before a multitude like a stage play and shouts and tumults with which the challenger had hitherto been unacquainted the judges were intended to be twelve but of the five four were the challenger's friends honest gentlemen but unskilled in judging of most hands and he offered again forty pounds to be allowed in six months to equal bales's masterpiece and he closes his appeal by declaring that bales had lost in several parts of the trial neither did the judges deny that bales possessed himself of the golden pen by a trick before judgment was awarded alleging the sickness of his wife to be extreme he desired she might have a sight of the golden pen to comfort her the ancient gentleman who was the holder taking the defendant's word allowed the golden pen to be carried to the sick wife and bales immediately pawned it and afterwards to make sure work sold it at a great loss so that when the judges met for their definite sentence nor pen nor pennyworth was to be had the judges being ashamed of their own conduct were compelled to give such a verdict as suited the occasion bales rejoins he publishes to the universe the day and the hour when the judges brought the golden pen to his house and while he checks the insolence of this bobadil to show himself no requiem assumes the golden pen for his sign such is the shortest history i could contrive of the chivalry of the pen something mysteriously clouds over the fate of the defendant bales's history like caesar's is but an ex parte evidence who can tell whether he has not slurred over his defeats and only dwelt on his victories there is a strange phrase connected with the art of the calligrapher which i think may be found in most if not in all modern languages to write like an angel ladies have been frequently compared with angels they are beautiful as angels and sing and dance like angels but however intelligible these are we do not so easily connect penmanship with the other celestial accomplishments this fanciful phrase however has a very human origin among those learned greeks who emigrated to italy and afterwards into france in the reign of francis i was one angelo vergeccio whose beautiful calligraphy excited the admiration of the learned the french monarch had a greek fount cast modelled by his writing the learned henry stephens who like our porson for correctness and delicacy was one of the most elegant writers of greek had learnt the practice from our angelo his name became synonymous for beautiful writing and gave birth to the vulgar proverb or familiar phrase to write like an angel End of section twenty.
section twenty one of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli the italian historians it is remarkable that the country which has long lost its political independence may be considered as the true parent of modern history the greater part of their historians have abstained from the applause of their contemporaries while they have not the less elaborately composed their posthumous folios consecrated solely to truth and posterity the true principles of national glory are opened by the grandeur of the minds of these asserters of political freedom it was their indignant spirit seeking to console its injuries by confiding them to their secret manuscripts which raised up this singular phenomenon in the literary world of the various causes which produce such a lofty race of patriots one is prominent the proud recollections of their roman fathers often troubled the dreams of the sons the petty rival republics and the petty despotic principalities which had started up from some great families who at first came forward as the protectors of the people from their exterior enemies or their interior factions at length settled into a corruption of power a power which had been conferred on them to preserve liberty itself these factions often shook by their jealousies their fears and their hatreds that divided land which groaned whenever they witnessed the ultramontans descending from their alps and their apennines petrarch in a noble invective warmed by livy and ancient rome impatiently beheld the french and the germans passing the mounts enemies he cries so often conquered prepared to strike with swords which formerly served us to raise our trophies shall the mistress of the world bear chains forged by hands which she has so often bound to their backs machiavel in his exhortations to free italy from the barbarians rouses his country against their changeable masters the germans the french and the spaniards closing with the verse of petrarch that short shall be the battle for which virtue arms to show the world nor has this sublime patriotism declined even in more recent times i cannot resist from preserving in this place a sonnet by felicaya which i could never read without participating in the agitation of the writer for the ancient glory of his degenerated country the energetic personification of the close perhaps surpasses even his more celebrated sonnet preserved in lord byron's notes to the fourth canto of child harold dovitalia il tuo braccio e ace ti servi tu del altrui non sio scorgio il vero di ci t'offende il defensor menfero ambe nemici sono ambo fur servi cosi dunque l'onor cosi conservi gli avanzi tu del glorioso impero cosi al valor cosi al valor premiero che a te fede giuero la fede a servi or va repudia il valor prisco e sposa lozio e fra il sangue il gemiti e la elestrida nel periglio maggior dormi e riposa dormi al del terra vil fin che omicida 
spada il trice ti svegli e sonacciosa e nuda imbraccio al tuo fidel tu cida o italy where is thine arm what purpose serves so to be helped by others deem i right among offenders thy defender stands both are thy enemies both were thy servants thus dost thou honour thus dost thou preserve the mighty boundaries of the glorious empire and thus to valour to thy pristine valour that swore its faith to thee thy faith thou keep'st go and divorce thyself from thy old valiance and merry idleness and midst the blood the heavy groans and cries of agony in thy last danger sleep and seek repose sleep vile adulteress the homicidal sword vengeful shall waken thee and lull to slumber while naked in thy minions arms shall strike among the domestic contests of italy the true principles of political freedom were developed and in that country we may find the origin of that philosophical history which includes so many important views and so many new results unknown to the ancients machiavel seems to have been the first writer who discovered the secret of what may be called comparative history he it was who first sought in ancient history for the materials which were to illustrate the events of his own times by fixing on analogous facts similar personages and parallel periods this was enlarging the field of history and opening a new combination for philosophical speculation his profound genius advanced still further he not only explained modern by ancient history but he deduced those results or principles founded on this new sort of evidence which guided him in forming his opinions history had hitherto been if we accept tacitus but a story well told and by writers of limited capacity the detail and number of facts had too often been considered as the only valuable portion of history an erudition of facts is not the philosophy of history an historian unskilful in the art of applying his facts amasses impure ore which he cannot strike into coin the chancellor d'aguesseau in his instructions to his son on the study of history has admirably touched on this distinction minds which are purely historical mistake a fact for an argument they are so accustomed to satisfy themselves by repeating a great number of facts and enriching their memory that they become incapable of reasoning on principles it often happens that the result of their knowledge breeds confusion and universal indecision for their facts often contradictory only raise up doubts the superfluous and the frivolous occupy the place of what is essential and solid or at least so overload and darken it that we must sail with them in a sea of trifles to get to firm land those who only value the philosophical part of history fall into an opposite extreme they judge of what has been done by that which should be done while the others always decide on what should be done by that which has been the first are the dupes of their reasoning the second of the facts which they mistake for reasoning we should not separate two things which ought always to go in concert and mutually lend an aid reason and example avoid equally the contempt of some philosophers for the science of facts and the distaste or the incapacity which those who confine themselves to facts often contract for whatever depends on pure reasoning true and solid philosophy should direct us in the study of history and the study of history should give perfection to philosophy 
such was the enlightened opinion as far back as at the beginning of the seventeenth century of the studious chancellor of france before the more recent designation of philosophical history was so generally received and so familiar on our title pages from the moment that the florentine secretary conceived the idea that the history of the roman people opening such varied spectacles of human nature served as a point of comparison to which he might perpetually recur to try the analogous facts of other nations and the events passing under his own eye a new light broke out and ran through the vast extents of history the maturity of experience seemed to have been obtained by the historian in his solitary meditation livy in the grandeur of rome and tacitus in its faded decline exhibited for machiavel a moving picture of his own republics the march of destiny in all human governments the text of livy and tacitus revealed to him many and imperfect secret the fuller truth he drew from the depth of his own observations on his own times in machiavel's discourses on livy we may discover the foundations of our philosophical history the example of machiavel like that of all creative genius influenced the character of his age and his history of florence produced an emulative spirit among a new dynasty of historians the italian historians have proved themselves to be an extraordinary race for they devoted their days to the composition of historical works which they were certain could not see the light during their lives they nobly determined that their works should be posthumous rather than be compelled to mutilate them for the press these historians were rather the saints than the martyrs of history they did not always personally suffer for truth but during their protracted labour they sustained their spirit by anticipating their glorified after-state among these italian historians must be placed the illustrious gucciardini the friend of machiavel no perfect edition of this historian existed till recent times the history itself was posthumous nor did his nephew venture to publish it till twenty years after the historian's death he only gave the first sixteen books and these castrated the obnoxious passages consisted of some statements relating to the papal court then so important in the affairs of europe some account of the origin and progress of the papal power some eloquent pictures of the abuses and disorders of that corrupt court and some free caricatures on the government of florence the precious fragments were fortunately preserved in manuscript and the protestants procured transcripts which they published separately but which were long very rare footnote they were printed at basel in fifteen sixty nine at london in fifteen ninety five in amsterdam sixteen sixty three how many attempts to echo the voice of suppressed truth hames bibliotheca italiano eighteen o three end of footnote all the italian editions continue to be reprinted in the same truncated condition and appear only to have been reinstated in the immortal history so late as in seventeen seventy five thus it required two centuries before an editor could venture to give the world the pure and complete text of the manuscript of the lieutenant-general of the papal army who had been so close and so indignant an observer of the roman cabinet adriani whom his son entitles gentiluomo fiorentino the writer of the pleasing dissertation on the ancient painters noticed by pliny prefixed to his friend vasari's biographies wrote as a continuation of gucciardini a history of his own times in twenty-two books of which danina gives the highest character for its moderate spirit and from which de tu has largely drawn and commends for its authenticity 
our author however did not venture to publish his history during his lifetime it was after his death that his son became the editor nardi of a noble family and high in office famed for a translation of livy which rivals its original in the pleasure it affords in his retirement from public affairs wrote a history of florence which closes with the loss of the liberty of his country in fifteen thirty one it was not published till fifty years after his death even then the editors suppressed many passages which are found in manuscript in the libraries of florence and venice with other historical documents of this noble and patriotic historian about the same time the senator philip nurley was writing his commentary de fati civili which had occurred in florence he gave them with his dying hand to his nephew who presented the manuscripts to the grand duke yet although this work is rather an apology than a crimination of the medici family for their ambitious views and their overgrown power probably some state reason interfered to prevent the publication which did not take place till one hundred and fifty years after the death of the historian bernardo Segni composed a history of florence still more valuable which shared the same fate as that of nerley it was only after his death that his relatives accidentally discovered this history of florence which the author had carefully concealed during his lifetime he had abstained from communicating to any one the existence of such a work while he lived that he might not be induced to check the freedom of his pen nor compromise the cause and the interests of truth his heirs presented it to one of the medici family who threw it aside another copy had been more carefully preserved from which it was printed in seventeen thirteen about one hundred and fifty years after it had been written it appears to have excited great curiosity for l'anglais du fresnois observes that the scarcity of this history is owing to the circumstance of the grand duke having bought up the copies du fresnois indeed has noticed more than once this sort of address of the grand duke for he observes on the florentine history of bruto that the work was not common the grand duke having bought up the copies to suppress them the author was even obliged to fly from italy for having delivered his opinions too freely on the house of the medici this honest historian thus expresses himself at the close of his work my design has but one end that our posterity may learn by these notices the root and the causes of so many troubles which we have suffered while they expose the malignity of those men who have raised them up or prolonged them as well as the goodness of those who did all which they could to turn them away it was the same motive the fear of offending the great personages or their families of whom these historians had so freely written which deterred benedetto varchi from publishing his well-known storie fiorentine which was not given to the world till seventeen twenty one a period which appears to have roused the slumbers of the literary men of italy to recur to their native historians varchi who wrote with so much zeal the history of his fatherland is noticed by nardi as one who never took an active part in the events he records never having combined with any party and living merely as a spectator this historian closes the narrative of a horrid crime of peter louis farnese with this admirable reflection i know well this story with many others which i have freely exposed may hereafter prevent the reading of my history but also i know that besides what tacitus has said on this subject the great duty of an historian is not to be more careful of the reputation of persons than is suitable with truth which is to be preferred to all things however detrimental it may be to the writer footnote my friend mr merivale whose critical research is only equalled by the elegance of his taste has supplied me with a note which proves but too well that even writers who compose uninfluenced by party feelings may not however be sufficiently scrupulous in weighing the evidence of the facts which they collect 
mr merivale observes the strange and improbable narrative with which varchi has the misfortune of closing his history should not have been even hinted at without adding that it is denounced by other writers as a most impudent forgery invented years after the occurrences supposed to have happened by the apostate bishop petrus paulus vergerius see its refutation in ammiani historico di fano to one hundred and forty nine et si qui a one hundred and sixty varchi's character as an historian cannot but suffer greatly from his having given it insertion on such authority the responsibility of an author for the truth of what he relates should render us very cautious of giving credit to the writers of memoirs not intended to see the light till a distant period the credibility of vergerius as an acknowledged libeller of pope paul the third and his family appears still more conclusively from his article in bale note k it must be added that the calumny of vergerius may be found in wolfius's lecturis memorium two six hundred and ninety one in a tract de idolo lauretano published fifteen fifty six varchi is more particular in his details of this monstrous tale vergerius's libels universally read at the time though they were collected afterwards are now not to be met with even in public libraries whether there was any truth in the story of peter louis farnese i know not but crimes of as monstrous a die occur in the authentic guicciardini the story is not yet forgotten since in the last edition of hames bibliotheca italiana the best edition is marked as that which at page six hundred and thirty nine contains la scelleratezza di pier louis farnese i am of opinion that varchi believed the story by the solemnity of his proposition whatever be its truth the historian's feeling was elevated and intrepid End of footnote. such was that free manner of thinking and of writing which prevailed in these italian historians who often living in the midst of the ruins of popular freedom poured forth their injured feelings in their secret pages without the hope and perhaps without the wish of seeing them published in their lifetime a glorious example of self-denial and lofty patriotism had it been inquired of these writers why they did not publish their histories they might have answered in nearly the words of an ancient sage because i am not permitted to write as i would and i would not write as i am permitted we cannot imagine that these great men were in the least insensible to the applause they denied themselves they were not of tempers to be turned aside and it was the highest motive which can inspire an historian a stern devotion to truth which reduced them to silence but not to inactivity these florentine and venetian historians ardent with truth and profound in political sagacity were writing these legacies of history solely for their countrymen hopeless of their gratitude if a frenchman footnote, rapin and a footnote wrote the english history that labour was the aliment of his own glory if hume and robertson devoted their pens to history the motive of the task was less glorious than their work but here we discover a race of historians whose patriotism alone instigated their secret labour and who substituted for fame and fortune that mightier spirit which amidst their conflicting passions has developed the truest principles and even the errors of political freedom none of these historians we have seen published their works in their lifetime i have called them the saints of history rather than the martyrs one however had the intrepidity to risk this awful responsibility and he stands forth among the most illustrious and ill-fated examples of historical martyrdom this great historian is gianone whose civil history of the kingdom of naples is remarkable for its profound inquiries concerning the civil and ecclesiastical constitution the laws and customs of that kingdom 
with some interruptions from his professional avocations at the bar twenty years were consumed in writing this history researches on ecclesiastical usurpations and severe strictures on the clergy are the chief subjects of his bold and unreserved pen these passages curious grave and indignant were afterwards extracted from the history by vernet and published in a small volume under the title of anecdote ecclesiastique seventeen thirty eight when giannone consulted with a friend on the propriety of publishing his history his critic in admiring the work predicted the fate of the author you have said he placed on your head a crown of thorns and of very sharp ones the historian set at naught his own personal repose and in seventeen twenty three this elaborate history saw the light from that moment the historian never enjoyed a day of quiet rome attempted at first to extinguish the author with his work all the books were seized on and copies of the first edition are of extreme rarity to escape the fangs of inquisitorial power the historian of naples flew from naples on the publication of his immortal work the fugitive and excommunicated author sought an asylum at vienna where though he found no friend in the emperor prince eugene and other nobles became his patrons forced to quit vienna he retired to venice when a new persecution arose from the jealousy of the state inquisitors who one night landed him on the borders of the pope's dominions escaping unexpectedly with his life to geneva he was preparing a supplemental volume to his celebrated history when enticed by a treacherous friend to a catholic village giannone was arrested by an order of the king of sardinia his manuscripts were sent to rome and the historian imprisoned in a fort it is curious that the imprisoned giannone wrote a vindication of the rights of the king of sardinia against the claims of the court of rome this powerful appeal to the feelings of this sovereign was at first favourably received but under the secret influence of rome the sardinian monarch on the extraordinary plea that he kept giannone as a prisoner of state that he might preserve him from the papal power ordered that the vindicator of his rights should be more closely confined than before and for this purpose transferred his state prisoner to the citadel of turin where after twelve years of persecution and of agitation our great historian closed his life such was the fate of this historical martyr whose work the catholic haim describes as opera scritta con molto fiusce e troppo liberta he hints that this history is only paralleled by de tu's great work this italian history will ever be ranked among the most philosophical but profound as was the masculine genius of giannone such was his love of fame that he wanted the intrepidity requisite to deny himself the delight of giving his history to the world though some of his great predecessors had set him a noble and dignified example one more observation on these italian historians all of them represent man in his darkest colours their drama is terrific the actors are monsters of perfidy of inhumanity and inventors of crimes which seem to want a name they were all princes of darkness and the age seemed to afford a triumph of manichaeism the worst passions were called into play by all parties but if something is to be ascribed to the manners of the times much more may be traced to that science of politics which sought for mastery in an undefinable struggle of ungovernable political power in the remorseless ambition of the despots and the hatreds and jealousies of the republics these italian historians have formed a perpetual satire on the contemptible simulation and dissimulation and the inexpiable crimes of that system of politics which has derived a name from one of themselves the great may we add the calumniated machiavel end of section twenty one
section twenty two of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli of palaces built by ministers our ministers and court favourites as well as those on the continent practised a very impolitical custom and one likely to be repeated although it has never failed to cast a popular odium on their names exciting even the envy of their equals in the erection of palaces for themselves which outvied those of their sovereign and which to the eyes of the populace appeared as a perpetual and insolent exhibition of what they deemed the ill-earned wages of peculation oppression and court favour we discover the seduction of this passion for ostentation this haughty sense of their power and this self-idolatry even among the most prudent and the wisest of our ministers and not one but lived to lament over this vain act of imprudence to these ministers the noble simplicity of pitt will ever form an admirable contrast while his personal character as a statesman descends to posterity unstained by calumny the houses of cardinal wolsey appear to have exceeded the palaces of the sovereign in magnificence and potent as he was in all the pride of pomp the great cardinal found rabid envy pursuing him so close at his heels that he relinquished one palace after the other and gave up as gifts to the monarch what in all his overgrown greatness he trembled to retain for himself the state satire of that day was often pointed at this very circumstance as appears in skelton's why come ye not to court and roy's read me and be not wroth footnote skelton's satire is accessible to the reader in the rev alexander dice's edition of the poet's works roy's poem was printed abroad about fifteen twenty five and is of extreme rarity as the cardinal spared no labour and expense to purchase and destroy all the copies a second edition was printed at wessel in fifteen forty six its author who had been a friar was ultimately burned in portugal for heresy End of footnote. skelton's railing rhymes leave their bitter teeth in his purple pride and the style of both these satirists if we use our own orthography shows how little the language of the common people has varied during three centuries set up a wretch on high in a throne triumphantly make him a great state and he will play checkmate with royal majesty the king's court should have the excellence but hampton court hath the preeminence and york place footnote the palace of wolsey as archbishop of york which he had furnished in the most sumptuous manner after his disgrace it became a royal residence under the name of whitehall note in dice's edition of skelton's works End of footnote. with my lord's grace to whose magnificence is all the confluence suits and supplications embassies of all nations roy in contemplating the palace is maliciously reminded of the butcher's lad and only gives plain sense in plain words hath the cardinal any gay mansion great palaces without comparison most glorious of outward sight and within decked point device footnote point device a term explained by mr deuce he thinks that it is borrowed from the labours of the needle as we have point lace so point device that is point a stitch and device devised or invented applied to describe anything uncommonly exact 
or worked with the nicety and precision of stitches made or devised by the needle illustrations of shakespeare one ninety three but mr gifford has since observed that the origin of the expression is perhaps yet to be sought for he derives it from a mathematical phrase a point de vise, or a given point and hence exact correct etc ben jonson volume four one seventy see for various examples mr nares's glossary article point device end of footnote more like unto a paradise than an earthly habitation he cometh then of some noble stock his father could match a bullock a butcher by his occupation whatever we may now think of the structure in the low apartments of wolsey's palace it is described not only in his own times but much later as of unparalleled magnificence and indeed cavendish's narrative of the cardinal's entertainment of the french ambassadors gives an idea of the ministerial prelate's imperial establishment very puzzling to the comprehension of a modern inspector six hundred persons i think were banqueted and slept in an abode which appears to us so mean but which stowe calls so stately a palace to avoid the odium of living in this splendid edifice wolsey presented it to the king who in recompense suffered the cardinal occasionally to inhabit this wonder of england in the character of keeper of the king's palace so that wolsey only dared to live in his own palace by a subterfuge this perhaps was a tribute which ministerial haughtiness paid to popular feeling or to the jealousy of a royal master i have elsewhere shown the extraordinary elegance and prodigality of expenditure of buckingham's residences they were such as to have extorted the wonder even of bassompierre and unquestionably excited the indignation of those who lived in a poor court while our gay and thoughtless minister alone could indulge in the wanton profusion but wolsey and buckingham were ambitious and adventurous they rose and shone the comets of the political horizon of europe the roman tiara still haunted the imagination of the cardinal and the egotistic pride of having outrivalled richelieu and olivares the nominal ministers but the real sovereigns of europe kindled the buoyant spirits of the gay the gallant and the splendid villiers but what folly of the wise must account for the conduct of the profound clarendon and the sensible sir robert walpole who like the other two ministers equally became the victims of this imprudent passion for the ostentatious pomp of a palace this magnificence looked like the vaunt of insolence in the eyes of the people and covered the ministers with a popular odium clarendon house is now only to be viewed in a print but its story remains to be told it was built on the site of grafton street and when afterwards purchased by monk the duke of albemarle he left his title to that well-known street it was an edifice of considerable extent and grandeur clarendon reproaches himself in his life for his weakness and vanity in the vast expense incurred in this building which he acknowledges had more contributed to that gust of envy that had so violently shaken him than any misdemeanour that he was thought to have been guilty of it ruined his estate but he had been encouraged to it by the royal grant of the land by that passion for building to which he owns he was naturally too much inclined and perhaps by other circumstances among which was the opportunity of purchasing the stones which had been designed for the rebuilding of st paul's but the envy it drew on him and the excess of the architect's proposed expense had made his life very uneasy and near insupportable the truth is that when this palace was finished it was imputed to him as a state crime 
all the evils in the nation which were then numerous pestilence conflagration war and defeats were discovered to be in some way connected with clarendon house or as it was popularly called either dunkirk house or tangier hall from a notion that it had been erected with the golden bribery which the chancellor had received for the sale of dunkirk and tangiers footnote burnet says others called it holland house because he was believed to be no friend to the war so it was given out that he had money from the dutch End of footnote he was reproached with having profaned the sacred stones dedicated to the use of the church the great but unfortunate master of this palace who from a private lawyer had raised himself by alliance even to royalty the father-in-law of the duke of york it was maliciously suggested had persuaded charles the second to marry the infanta of portugal knowing but how clarendon obtained the knowledge his enemies have not revealed that the portuguese princess was not likely to raise any obstacle to the inheritance of his own daughter to the throne at the restoration among other enemies clarendon found that the royalists were none of the least active he was reproached by them for preferring those who had been the cause of their late troubles the same reproach was incurred on the restoration of the bourbons it is perhaps more political to maintain active men who have obtained power than to reinstate inferior talents who at least have not their popularity this is one of the parallel cases which so frequently strike us in exploring political history and the ultras of louis the eighteenth were only the royalists of charles the second there was a strong popular delusion carried on by the wits and the misses who formed the court of charles the second that the government was as much shared by the hydes as the stuarts we have in the state poems an unsparing lampoon entitled clarendon's housewarming but a satire yielding nothing to it in severity i have discovered in manuscript and it is also remarkable for turning chiefly on a pun of the family name of the earl of clarendon the witty and malicious rhymer after making charles the second demand the great seal and resolve to be his own chancellor proceeds reflecting on the great political victim lo his whole ambition already divides the sceptre between the stuarts and the hydes behold in the depth of our plague and wars he built him a palace outbraves the stars which house we dunkirk he clarendon names looks down with shame upon st james but tis not his golden globe that will save him being less than the custom house farmers gave him his chapel for consecration calls whose sacrilege plundered the stones from paul's when queen dido landed she bought as much ground as the hide of a lusty fat bull would surround but when the said hide was cut into thongs a city and kingdom to hide belongs so here in court church and country far and wide here is naught to be seen but hide 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 of old and where law the kingdom divides twas our hides of land tis now land of hides clarendon house was a palace which had been raised with at least as much fondness as pride and evelyn tells us that the garden was planned by himself and his lordship but the cost as usual trebled the calculation and the noble master grieved in silence amidst this splendid pile of architecture Footnote at the gateway of the three kings inn near dover street in piccadilly are two pilasters with corinthian capitals which belong to clarendon house and are perhaps the only remains of that edifice End of footnote. 
even when in his exile the sale was proposed to pay his debts and secure some provision for his younger children he honestly tells us that he remained so infatuated with the delight he had enjoyed that though he was deprived of it he hearkened very unwillingly to the advice in sixteen eighty three clarendon house met its fate and was abandoned to the brokers who had purchased it for its materials an affecting circumstance is recorded by evelyn on this occasion in returning to town with the earl of clarendon the son of the great earl in passing by the glorious palace his father built but a few years before which they were now demolishing being sold to certain undertakers footnote an old term for contractors evelyn tells us they were certain rich bankers and mechanics who gave for it and the ground about it thirty five thousand pounds they built streets and houses on the site to their great profit the ground comprising twenty four acres of land End of footnote i turned my head to the contrary way till the coach was gone past by lest i might minister occasion of speaking of it which must needs have grieved him that in so short a time this pomp was fallen a feeling of infinite delicacy so perfectly characteristic of evelyn and now to bring down this subject to time still nearer we find that sir robert walpole had placed himself exactly in the situation of the great minister we have noticed we have his confession to his brother lord walpole and to his friend sir john hind cotton the historian of this minister observes that his magnificent building at houghton drew on him great obloquy on seeing his brother's house at walterton sir robert expressed his wishes that he had contented himself with a similar structure in the reign of anne sir robert sitting by sir john hind cotton alluding to a sumptuous house which was then building by harley observed that to construct a great house was a high act of imprudence in any minister it was a long time after when he had become prime minister that he forgot the whole result of the present article and pulled down his family mansion at houghton to build its magnificent edifice it was then sir john hin cotton reminded him of the reflection which he had made some years ago the reply of sir robert is remarkable your recollection is too late i wish you had reminded me of it before i began building for then it might have been of service to me the statesman and politician then are susceptible of all the seduction of ostentation and the pride of pomp who would have credited it but bewildered with power in the magnificence and magnitude of the edifices which their colossal greatness inhabits they seem to contemplate on its image sir francis walsingham died and left nothing to pay his debts as appears by a curious fact noticed in the anonymous life of sir philip sidney prefixed to the arcadia and evidently written by one acquainted with the family history of his friend and hero the chivalric sidney though sought after by court beauties solicited the hand of the daughter of walsingham although as it appears she could have had no other portion than her own virtues and her father's name and herein observes our anonymous biographer he was exemplary to all gentlemen not to carry their love in their purses on this he notices this secret history of walsingham this is that sir francis who impoverished himself to enrich the state and indeed made england his heir and was so far from building up a fortune by the benefit of his place that he demolished that fine estate left him by his ancestors to purchase dear intelligence from all parts of christendom he had a key to unlock the pope's cabinet and as if master of some invisible whispering place all the secrets of christian princes met at his closet wonder not then if he bequeathed no great wealth to his daughter being privately interred in the choir of paul's as much indebted to his creditors though not so much as our nation is indebted to his memory 
some curious inquirer may afford us a catalogue of great ministers of state who have voluntarily declined the augmentation of their private fortune while they devoted their days to the noble pursuits of patriotic glory the labour of this research will be great and the volume small end of section twenty two section twenty three of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli taxation no tyranny such was the title of a famous political tract which was issued at a moment when a people in a state of insurrection put forth a declaration that taxation was tyranny it was not against an insignificant tax they protested but against taxation itself and in the temper of the moment this abstract proposition appeared an insolent paradox it was instantly run down by that everlasting party which so far back as in the laws of our henry the first are designated by the odd descriptive term of acephaly a people without heads the strange equality of levellers footnote cowles interpreter article acephaly this by name we unexpectedly find in a grave antiquarian law dictionary probably derived from pliny's description of a people whom some travellers had reported to have found in this predicament in their fright and haste in attempting to land on a hostile shore among savages to account for this fabulous people it has been conjectured they wore such high coverings that their heads did not appear above their shoulders while their eyes seemed to be placed in their breasts how this name came to be introduced into the laws of henry the first remains to be told by some profound antiquary but the allusion was common in the middle ages cowell says those are called acephaly who were the levellers of that age and acknowledged no head or superior End of footnote. these political monsters in all times have had an association of ideas of taxation and tyranny and with them one name instantly suggests the other this happened to one gigli of siena who published the first part of a dictionary of the tuscan language footnote vocabulario di santa caterina el della lingua senese seventeen seventeen this pungent lexicon was prohibited at rome by desire of the court of florence the history of this suppressed work may be found in il giornale de letterati d'italia tomo xxix one thousand four hundred and ten in the last edition of hames bibliotheca italiana eighteen o three it is said to be reprinted at manila nel isole Filippine for the book licensers it is a great way to go for it End of, footnote. of which only three hundred and twelve leaves amused the florentines these having had the honour of being consigned to the flames by the hands of the hangman for certain popular errors such as for instance under the word grand duca we find vedi cabelli see taxes and the word gabella was explained by a reference to grand duca grand duke and taxes were synonyms according to this mordacious lexicographer such grievances and the modes of expressing them are equally ancient a roman consul by levying a tax on salt during the punic war was nicknamed salinator and condemned by the majesty of the people 
he had formerly done his duty to the country but the psalter was now his reward he retired from rome let his beard grow and by his sordid dress and melancholy air evinced his acute sensibility the romans at length wanted the psalter to command the army as an injured man he refused but he was told that he should bear the caprice of the roman people with the tenderness of a son for the humours of a parent he had lost his reputation by a productive tax on salt though this tax had provided an army and obtained a victory certain it is that gigli and his numerous adherents are wrong for were they freed from all restraints as much as if they slept in forests and not in houses were they inhabitants of wilds and not of cities so that every man should be his own lawgiver with a perpetual immunity from all taxation we could not necessarily infer their political happiness there are nations where taxation is hardly known for the people exist in such utter wretchedness that they are too poor to be taxed of which the chinese among others exhibit remarkable instances when nero would have abolished all taxes in his excessive passion for popularity the senate thanked him for his good will to the people but assured him that this was a certain means not of repairing but of ruining the commonwealth baudin in his curious work the republic has noticed a class of politicians who are in too great favour with the people many seditious citizens and desirous of innovations did of late years promise immunity of taxes and subsidies to our people but neither could they do it or if they could have done it they would not or if it were done should we have any commonweal being the ground and foundation of one footnote bowden's six books of a commonwealth translated by richard knowles sixteen o six a work replete with the practical knowledge of politics and of which mr dougall stuart has delivered a high opinion yet this great politician wrote a volume to anathematize those who doubted the existence of sorcerers and witches etc whom he condemns to the flames see his demona Manie de sorcier fifteen ninety three end of footnote the undisguised and naked term of taxation is however so odious to the people that it may be curious to observe the arts practised by governments and even by the people themselves to veil it under some mitigating term in the first breaking out of the american troubles they probably would have yielded to the mother country the right of taxation modified by the term regulation of their trade this i infer from a letter of dr robertson who observes that the distinction between taxation and regulation is mere folly even despotic governments have condescended to disguise the contributions forcibly levied by some appellative which should partly conceal its real nature terms have often influenced circumstances as names do things and conquest or oppression which we may allow to be synonyms apes benevolence whenever it claims as a gift what it exacts as a tribute a sort of philosophical history of taxation appears in the narrative of wood in his inquiry on homer he tells us that the presence a term of extensive signification in the east which are distributed annually by the bashaw of damascus to the several arab princes through whose territory he conducts the caravan of pilgrims to mecca are at constantinople called a free gift and considered as an act of the sultan's generosity towards his indigent subjects while on the other hand the arab sheikhs deny even a right of passage through the districts of their command and exact those sums as a tax due for the permission of going through their country in the frequent bloody contests which the adjustment of these fees produces the turks complain of robbery and the arabs of invasion 
here we trace taxation through all its shifting forms accommodating itself to the feelings of the different people the same principle regulated the alternate terms proposed by the buccaneers when they asked what the weaker party was sure to give or when they levied what the others paid only as a common toll when louis the eleventh of france beheld his country exhausted by the predatory wars of england he bought a piece of our edward the fourth by an annual sum of fifty thousand crowns to be paid at london and likewise granted pensions to the english ministers holinshed and all our historians call this a yearly tribute but comines the french memoir writer with a national spirit denies that these gifts were either pensions or tributes yet says bodin a frenchman also but affecting a more philosophical indifference it must be either the one or the other though i confess that those who receive a pension to obtain peace commonly boast of it as if it were a tribute such are the shades of our feelings in this history of taxation and tribute but there is another artifice of applying soft names to hard things by veiling a tyrannical act by a term which presents no disagreeable idea to the imagination when it was formerly thought desirable in the relaxation of morals which prevailed in venice to institute the office of censor three magistrates were elected bearing this title but it seemed so harsh and austere in that dissipated city that these reformers of manners were compelled to change their title when they were no longer called censors but e signore sopra il bon vivere della cita all agreed on the propriety of the office under the softened term father joseph the secret agent of cardinal richelieu was the inventor of lettres de cachet disguising that instrument of despotism by the amusing term of a sealed letter expatriation would have been merciful compared with the result of that billet doux a sealed letter from his majesty burke reflects with profound truth abstract liberty like other mere abstractions is not to be found liberty inheres in some sensible object and every nation has formed to itself some favourite point which by way of eminence becomes the criterion of their happiness it happened that the great contests for freedom in this country were from the earliest times chiefly upon the question of taxing most of the contests in the ancient commonwealths turned primarily on the right of election of magistrates or on the balance among the several orders of the state the question of money was not with them so immediate but in england it was otherwise on this point of taxes the ablest pens and most eloquent tongues have been exercised the greatest spirits have acted and suffered one party clamorously asserts that taxation is their grievance while another demonstrates that the annihilation of taxes would be their ruin the interests of a great nation among themselves are often contrary to each other and each seems alternately to predominate and to decline the sting of taxation observes mr hallam is wastefulness but it is difficult to name a limit beyond which taxes will not be borne without impatience when faithfully applied in plainer words this only signifies we presume that mr hallam's party would tax us without wastefulness ministerial or opposition whatever be the administration it follows that taxation is no tyranny dr johnson then was terribly abused in his day for a vox et praeteria nihil still shall the innocent word be hateful and the people will turn even on their best friend who in administration inflicts a new impost as we have shown by the fate of the roman salinator among ourselves our government in its constitution if not always in its practice long had a consideration towards the feelings of the people and often contrived to hide the nature of its exactions by a name of blandishment 
an enormous grievance was long the office of purveyance a purveyor was an officer who was to furnish every sort of provision for the royal house and sometimes for great lords during their progresses or journeys his oppressive office by arbitrarily fixing the market prices and compelling the countrymen to bring their articles to market would enter into the history of the arts of grinding the labouring class of society a remnant of feudal tyranny the very title of this officer became odious and by a statute of edward the third the hateful name of purveyor was ordered to be changed into achateur or buyer footnote the modern word cheater is traced by some authors to this term which soon became odious to the populace in the footnote a change of name it was imagined would conceal its nature the term often devised strangely contrasted with the thing itself levies of money were long raised under the pathetic appeal of benevolences when edward the fourth was passing over to france he obtained under this gentle demand money towards the great journey and afterwards having rowed about the more part of the lands and used the people in such fair manner that they were liberal in their gifts oh fabian adds the which way of the levying of this money was after named a benevolence edward the fourth was courteous in this newly invented style and was besides the handsomest tax-gatherer in his kingdom his royal presence was very dangerous to the purses of his loyal subjects particularly to those of the females in his progress having kissed a widow for having contributed a larger sum than was expected from her estate she was so overjoyed at the singular honour and delight that she doubled her benevolence and a second kiss had ruined her in the succeeding reign of richard the third the term had already lost the freshness of its innocence in the speech which the duke of buckingham delivered from the hustings in guildhall he explained the term to the satisfaction of his auditors who even then were as cross-humoured as the livery of this day in their notions of what now we gently call supplies under the plausible name of benevolence as it was held in the time of edward the fourth your goods were taken from you much against your will as if by that name was understood that every man should pay not what he pleased but what the king would have him or as a marginal note in buck's life of richard the third more pointedly has it that the name of benevolence signified that every man should pay not what he of his own good will list but what the king of his good will list to take footnote danes barrington in observations on the statutes gives the marginal note of buck as the words of the duke they certainly served his purpose to amuse better than the voracious ones but we expect from a grave antiquary inviolable authenticity the duke is made by barrington a sort of wit but the pithy quaintness is bucks End of footnote richard the third whose business like that of all usurpers was to be popular in a statute even condemns this benevolence as a new imposition and enacts that none shall be charged with it in future many families having been ruined under these pretended gifts his successor however found means to levy a benevolence but when henry the eighth demanded one the citizens of london appealed to the act of richard the third cardinal wolsey insisted that the law of a murderous usurper should not be enforced one of the common council courageously replied that king richard conjointly with parliament had enacted many good statutes even then the citizen seems to have comprehended the spirit of our constitution that taxes should not be raised without the consent of parliament charles the first amidst his urgent wants at first had hoped by the pathetic appeal to benevolences that he should have touched the hearts of his unfriendly commoners but the term of benevolence proved unlucky 
the resisters of taxation took full advantage of a significant meaning which had long been lost in the custom asserting by this very term that all levies of money were not compulsory but the voluntary gifts of the people in that political crisis when in the fullness of time all the national grievances which had hitherto been kept down started up with one voice the courteous term strangely contrasted with the rough demand lord digby said the granting of subsidies under so preposterous a name as of a benevolence was a malevolence and mr grimstone observed that they have granted a benevolence but the nature of thing agrees not with the name the nature indeed had so entirely changed from the name that when james i had tried to warm the hearts of his benevolent people he got little money and lost a great deal of love subsidies that is grants made by parliament observes arthur wilson a dispassionate historian get more of the people's money but exactions enslave the mind when benevolences had become a grievance to diminish the odium they invented more inviting phrases the subject was cautiously informed that the sums demanded were only loans or he was honoured by a letter under the privy seal a bond which the king engaged to repay at a definite period but privy seals at length got to be hawked about to persons coming out of church privy seals says a manuscript letter are flying thick and threefold in sight of all the world which might surely have been better performed in delivering them to every man privately at home the general loan which in fact was a forced loan was one of the most crying grievances under charles the first ingenious in the destruction of his own popularity the king contrived a new mode of secret instructions to commissioners footnote these private instructions to the commissioners for the general loan may be found in rushworth one four eighteen end of footnote they were to find out persons who could bear the largest rates how the commissioners were to acquire this secret and inquisitorial knowledge appears in the bungling contrivance it is one of their orders that after a number of inquiries have been put to a person concerning others who had spoken against loan money and what arguments they had used this person was to be charged in his majesty's name and upon his allegiance not to disclose to any other the answer he had given Given. a striking instance of that fatuity of the human mind when a weak government is trying to do what it knows not how to perform it was seeking to obtain a secret purpose by the most open and general means a self-destroying principle our ancestors were children in finance their simplicity has been too often described as tyranny but from my soul do i believe on this obscure subject of taxation that old burleigh's advice to elizabeth includes more than all the squabbling pamphlets of our political economists win hearts and you have their hands and purses End of section twenty three